Next up, we have uh, Constantine. He is a co-founder of uh, Travis CI. And he's going to talk about how he replaced salary negotiations with the uh, Sinatra app. Personally, I like apps that does this so we don't have to exercise our developer skills, uh, our social skills. Hello. This is on. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, this is exactly the motivation behind replacing salary negotiations with the Sinatra app. It's like this. I also really hate calling people. And if there's a... Um, Anyway, I'm Konstantin, Konstantin Hase on Twitter or RKH Popcorn. These are two of my many Twitter accounts, uh, just RKH on GitHub. If you want to, I don't know, tweet at me. Anyway, uh, let me be the first to welcome you all to Singapore. Uh, I'm happy to be back. And I'm giving a talk. This is the first time I'm giving a really a, top, a talk about this topic, and um, an important thing about this topic is I have actually no clue. Like, I'm probably one of the least qualified people. I have no real experience like as an employee from the salary discussion standpoint, and so on. Um, and this is actually... A, I don't want to say this is a non-technical talk because I actually think it's just, this is a very technical talk. Um, I, there will even be code. I promise there will be code in these slides. Um, obviously, when talking about salary. Who was here yesterday for Joe's talk, the lightning talk? Yes, so that actually said that salary isn't that important. So this talk doesn't, no, it did not say that salary isn't that important. It said it's not the reason that people leave. Um, I also think that this talk that I'm giving is not so much about salary, but more about development and leadership, or rather how we do things at Travis. Um, and I think it's an, an important aspect of that is that I'm trying to break a taboo here, um, a taboo that people have been breaking previously, uh, very famously with the talk pay hashtag and uh, some news articles and blog posts lately. Uh, it is a great taboo to talk about salaries. I don't know how it is in, in Singapore. Uh, I know in Europe and in the US it's not something people generally talk about uh, with their friends, with their colleagues. Um, but it's not just that. It's also not companies. Companies, I found, um, don't really talk about salaries either. I mentioned there was uh, the talk pay uh, hashtag where people were tweeting their salaries, their job, some details, and um, that gave a lot of momentum to having a conversation about salaries. Um, there's also bots that do that anonymously, so you don't need to reveal your salary. And there are some companies, a very small number, that are aggressively open about their salary structure. Um, most well-known, probably Buffer, who have published their salary formula. And not just their formula, they've actually published a complete list with names and everything of all their employees and the salaries they're paying. Um, but Buffer also is trying to be a very, very open uh, company about this, which is quite impressive. Uh, so recently, they saw themselves forced to let, let people go because they couldn't afford from their budget anymore to pay that uh, many salaries, um, which also brings us to, to, the, to one important aspect of this presentation, which is looking at salaries from the employer's side, like, as well as just what people are making, which actually is a side that, as a co-founder at Travis, I've had to deal with more often than the other side. But what actually is in a salary? And I think that's, that's where one of the, the major conflicts 
between employees and employers comes from, or the major friction points or interpretation differences, is the different view and interpretation of what the meaning of a salary is. Who knows these people? Yes, yes, is that a big thing here? The Big Bang Theory? So that's interesting. Let's talk about their salaries. <laughs> Does anyone know what they make? And how they're paid? A lot? <laughs> uh, yes, correct. No, not correct. Depends on who you talk about of these five. Um, so they all renegotiated their salaries last year. Um, initially, the three main actors renegotiated their salaries um, to one million per episode. Uh, so, uh, how do you pronounce it? Gallic, Gallic Parsons and Cuckoo, uh, playing Leonard Hofstadter, Sheldon Cooper, and Penny. Last name unknown, or at least I don't know. Um, got a deal of one million per episode in August 2015, at a time where um, Helberg, playing Howard Wolowitz, and Kunal Nayar, playing Rajesh, uh, were getting paid 100,000 per episode, um, which caused the two to try to renegotiate their salaries. Um, and they were aiming for getting salary parity with the other three, um, which was denied to them. They got a raise, which is undisclosed at, the, at this point, which is supposed to be in the mid-six digits. Um, but essentially, the salary uh, negotiation ended with the studios threatening to write them out of the series. And this makes you wonder, what does this mean? Does this mean that one's a 10 times actor, 10x actor? <laughs> this, is, this is a phrase from, that's very popular, especially in the Bay Area, this concept of the, the 10x developer. And this comes from, from a strong belief in an actually misused word in that context, I think, the belief in meritocracy, um, that uh, merit defines your standing in an organization. Um, this rock actually has been changed for one that believes in collaboration, so I didn't want to do like GitHub shaming or anything, but in the Bay Area, there, there is, as I said, this strong belief in the 10x developer. Uh, Quora is a great resource in general on such topics. Um, if you want to learn the difference between a full stack 10x generalist and unicorn programmer, uh, there, are, uh, there are other, like if on this topic, 10x engineers, there are the really great questions like, what do mediocre people do in Silicon Valley? <laughs> You gotta wonder. Uh, some of the questions are, why are the best programmers 10 times more productive than mediocre programmers, but paid only three times as much? Another interesting question, um, very interesting to me as well, is how do bootstrap companies hire talent? I've actually once was asked by someone in a, in a bar, like, you didn't take VC? How do you pay salaries? Um, anyway. Nothing against VC, just saying there are bootstrap companies and they do uh, pay salaries. I actually work for one of these. I actually founded, I'm a co-founder of one of these bootstrap companies. Uh, who here has heard of Travis CI? Uh, we bootstrapped, uh, founded in 2012. We have 38 employees at the moment. That was my last count from Slack uh, this morning. Um, I think we have some top talent. We're based in Berlin, Germany. We actually a, or try to be a remote first company. So we have employees in eight countries of 16 different nationalities. Also, again, I tried to count it this morning. There might be something off. 
Um, other interesting things to give you a feel, we, we have 54% uh, women uh, in our company, uh, in our engineering team, it's 50%, it's a one-to-one -one split. Um, with, uh, <laughs> with a very wide range of backgrounds, um, and we're actually planning to keep hiring in the future. And salaries is an important topic for us. From the company perspective, salaries currently account for 46% of our spendings. I think in most companies it's actually higher, at least most software companies, but our infrastructure costs are also very uh, massive. Um, but that on its own makes it the biggest cost center, if you just look at it from a budgeting standpoint. So any conversation that we have there, even if it's just changing it by a small percentage, has a big impact on our company finances. Um, salaries have actually, for a long time, been quite a mess at Travis, to be honest. We started Bootstrap, we started with not essentially having any money, and we started hiring in Europe, and specifically mostly in Berlin, which by Western standards is a really cheap city. And salary was based on, so what do you need? And that has actually led to, once we started hiring overseas, for instance, a very uneven, un, not well thought out uh, distribution and uh, you essentially got a raise when you said, ooh, money is really tight, I need more money, uh, but no one ever went like, oh, you've been here so long, great work. Um, so we've been having a discussion for quite a while in the company on how to change that and we came to the conclusion and the result is that we got rid of salary negotiations. At Travis CI, if you want to work at Travis CI, if you're going through a job interview, we do not negotiate salaries with you. Instead, we have a Sinatra app that will tell us how much we'll pay you. Why do we believe, before I tell you more about this app, why do we why are we trying to, to get rid of, why have we removed negotiations from this process? Well, we think that negotiation skills don't reflect your value to the company, which is the employer's approach to, to how you decide on salaries. If you remember um, that uh, the three main characters we have one point at a salary that was 10 times the salary of the other main characters in the Big Bang Theory. That was not based on them being uh, 10 times better actors. This was based on them being 10 times more valuable to the production of the show. So your negotiation skills are not the main value you provide to the company. Unless, of course, you're hired as a negotiator, then that's, that's a different discussion. The em employee's view on salary is different. It's not, it can be, the value argument can be used in a negotiation or in figuring out if it's appropriate, but the employee's view is usually in financial needs based. And your negotiation skills also don't reflect your financial needs. But most importantly, as one of our core values at Travis, we care about creating a diverse and welcoming working space. And we believe that salary negotiations harm underrepresented groups. Um, there is lots of evidence for this. For instance, women, people of color, generally underrepresented groups uh, often are impacted from things like imposter syndrome. Um, there has been a study for when uh, women and men look at a job ad and there are five requirements listed and um, for women one of the most common approaches is like I'm not so sure about this one requirement I'm really bad at this uh, I probably am not a good fit for this job and most men approach it with oh yeah I check off three of the five I can totally do this um, this is not 
any individual person. This is just a general thing that is more dominant in underrepresented groups. And there is also statistical data to prove the whole thing. Um, so salary negotiations are very likely to cause pay gaps within your company. So these are some of the things we wanted to tackle. And we've been working on this for over a year, and we call it the Trevor CI Salary Framework. We finally rolled it out, released it this March, company internally. And this here is the very first time we're actually talking about this publicly. So all the things I'm telling you are not really known outside of Travis. Let's first look at how, again, how other companies have solved this. Uh, Buffer also has an app. I don't actually know if that's Sinatra or not. Um, their approach is very, very formula-based. We also have a formula, but i get to that in a second. And you can actually access their app publicly. You can go to buffer.com slash salary, and then you can select your role, experience, location, and it will tell you exactly what you would make when you were to join a Buffer. But let's get back to our, our framework. So Buffer was a big source of inspiration and figuring these out because they also have public explanations of all the things. So we developed this framework for a full year and uh, very importantly to how we at Travis approach these things, this is a conversation that everyone in the company could take part in. So a lot of this was actually discussing aspects of what is a fair salary, for instance or what should be in a salary. So we decided that we want to pay by value and we want to pay by, need, by needs. So we want to take both these aspects into account. And we also want to come up with generalized rules that apply to everyone and that also everyone could question. So in a way you can negotiate salaries but you cannot negotiate your salary. You can, as an employee at Trevor CI, say, I think this pay difference is too big or we should in general pay higher salaries um, and then you can give a proper reasoning or we should our, increase our salaries because the euro is taking a nosedive because the UK is leaving the EU or something like that. But you can say, uh, I'd like to make like 500 bucks more a month. That's not an, an argument you can use. That's a screenshot of our app. This is confidential. <laughs> You're the first people seeing this outside of the company. Um, let's talk about what goes into this. Are, are people taking photos? Is this being recorded? <laughs> So let's talk about value. How do you measure value or how do you quantify what someone provides to the company? Um, Buffer does that with a factor. So they say you have an experience factor of 1.6 or something. Um, that is something we, we started off with, with playing with that, but we found really hard to what does that actually mean? And then everyone talks about uh, senior developers, but senior is such an overloaded term in the industry where there again is a massive mismatch between um, employer, employers and employees. Uh, similar to what does a 10x developer actually mean? So we instead decide to take an approach where we have levels. And then on these levels, we have certain expectations that are quite uh, meta, that when we have an employee at a certain level, we expect them to fulfill these expectations one way or another. 
So if you had the discussion, how do you define a 10x developer, if they even exist? Um, I don't really know how you'd place them on our levels, but let's just pick a level. Let's pick uh, the, the level 10 of our software engineering career path, and that has expectation like, shows an intuitive grasp of situations, analytic uh, approach only used in novel situations, which is basically, you see a problem, you already know how to fix it without having to analyze all these things. Um, is self-motivated to the point that they create new work for themselves and sometimes others, and understands business requirements, does not just understand but also shape the big picture. Uh, so these are very vague, and then you're supposed to work with your team lead at Travis CI on a regular basis, mostly through one-on-ones, setting specific goals for yourself um, to fulfill and reach the point where these are expectations the company can have towards you. We currently have our engineering career path defined up to level 17. We do not have anyone at level 17. The main intention is to show people that there is room to grow while at the same time staying a software engineer and staying at Travis CI. Because this is actually one thing we see happening in the industry so much. It's like people reach this point where they're a senior developer and then what? Like it's not just about salary. This is actually about uh, your professional growth, career development and so on, and not just about your bank account statement. And then you often see one of two things happen. Either people go to a different company to do something new and fun, or people become managers. And in both cases, you lose your best developers. In one case, you might swap them out for potentially a bad manager. Um, if, if someone wants to be a manager, like I'm not, I don't want to bad mouth developers becoming managers. Like if someone is really passionate about that, sure. But becoming a manager because it's the next logical step in your career path is a really, really bad reason. And these levels we've constructed or tried to phrase them in a way that employees should level up about once a year. So that it's also clear how often people can expect salary raises. And most importantly, we don't view this as a performance review that you get once a year that we can use to justify to not give people a raise, but instead as a program for us to grow people internally. If someone does not meet the expectations for the next level, that needs an investigation of what's going on. Is this some productivity issue? Do we have other problems here that we need to address? Or are our expectations wrong? You do not fix productivity issues by paying people less. The other aspect we take into account is needs. We use a generalized needs model based on location. This was actually a discussion initially where we assumed that the bigger discussion would be, should you pay by location or should you not pay by location? Actually, the opinion at Travis was pretty unanimously that you should pay by location. Uh, the bigger question was, how do you determine that, those differences? Um, but essentially, even if we wanted to not pay by location, just pay everyone on level 10, no matter where they are, the same salary, we could either not afford that, or we couldn't hire in California, essentially. But then we have the goal, had the goal that if we pay by location differences, we want to be scientific about this. We want to be reasonable about this. And we don't want to have someone 
basically get a worse deal because they're in a cheap or an expensive location. We don't just want to pay people in San Francisco more than everyone else, essentially. So how do you do that? There's one interesting statistic that's a Big Mac index. Has anyone heard about the Big Mac index? So Big Mac is a great thing because it's in so many countries and it's essentially the same supply chain, but it's different cost. So you can compare countries based on what the Big Mac costs. We do not use this for salary determination, by the way. Um, it's also, it's a bit unfair to have India in there, actually, because it's chicken meat in India, which has a different costs associated. Um, there's different conclusions you can draw from this, like uh, Big Macs are the most expensive in Switzerland. But that doesn't tell you actually much about Switzerland because if you then compare that to, or Norway, for instance, is the second most expensive. Um, it's the cheapest in South Africa. But if you compare it to how long it actually takes an average worker to work to get the money for a Big Mac, you see that Switzerland is still pretty good. And actually, Hong Kong is the best, where it takes, on average, 8.7 minutes of work to get a Big Mac. Whereas in, Ukraine, in Kiev, Ukraine, you have to work for almost an hour. There are actually way better statistics to reason about cost of living. One of my favorite is uh, Numbeo, which is actually something that we used. Uh, so we use Numbeo, we use the International Labor Organization, we use the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and we use Shadow Stats, which is basically going like, oh, those. Bureau of Labor Statistics statistics aren't actually that great to look at. Um, this uh, Numbeo is actually a crowdsourced um, database that gives you very detailed insight into, into living costs. For instance, for Singapore, it uses 6,300 something entries. Uh, you can see what a McDonald's meal costs as well, but also um, disposable income, rent, and so on. When, when, I, when we started investigating, I built a little web app um, where you can basically enter which city you live in, where you want to move, how much you make, um, and then you can calculate which salary you should aim for when you move there. It doesn't work well for Singapore because that data on there is outdated and some models in there are outdated, but it works quite well if you want to move from San Francisco to Berlin or the other way. Um, so say you make 130K and San Francisco means you should aim for uh, somewhere below 60k euros in Berlin if you want to keep the same standard of living. That's living costs, but also market rates are a big factor as well. Um, there, there are some websites like uh, Glassdoor uh, where people can, can enter their salaries and then it can give you an overview of a location. Uh, pay scale is similar. Uh, also, really nice to note they have like fifth and 95th percent, or I actually think, I think this is 10th and 90th percentile, and um, pay scale has that as well. For the US, thanks to the open government campaign under the Obama administration, you can actually just access the data from all the visa applications so you know what people are getting paid when they get a visa for the US or a green card. Important here is that you only compare data points from the same source because the visa data points, for instance, tend to be on the high end of the salary spectrum. So you shouldn't use that data point on its own, but you can use it quite well to compare two cities. And the same is uh, true for Glassdoor and Payscale, where salaries, at least in the US, where I can compare it to other sources, um, are more on the lower end. So I used that, I did a factor that's a comparison between Berlin and that city and um, created a splatter graph of the biggest cities in the world to see a correlation between market rates. Mar this is market rates compared to Berlin and this is living costs compared to Berlin. And you actually see that almost all the cities are on a very nice line. You also see that Singapore is quite the outlier. So. Um, Living costs are significantly higher here than in Berlin, but salaries are not proportionally higher as well. Um, and then, besides that, what we took into account is, I think I'm running bad on time. Oh, you're fine, it's okay. Good. 
Um, so what we also said, or what, what was more like, the conversation went like this. Um, so if we take living costs into account and rent and all these things, shouldn't we take income tax into account? And the conclusion was yes, we should, but you can't really calculate the income tax for everywhere in the world. Um, and then, oh, okay, that's right. And then I spent a weekend playing with some Ruby code, and turns out you can calculate the living co the income tax for everywhere in the world. I created a Ruby library. You can gem install income tax. You can tell it which country you're in. It doesn't do tax deductions or anything, even though someone emailed me and they want to do like a tax filing program for your, I don't know. I think they, I actually never got back to them. Anyway, um, so you can tell it how much you make or a salary, a country, and it will tell you about gross income, net income, taxes. And important for us, you can also tell it a net income, uh, like the income after taxes, and it will give you a gross income. Uh, interesting things I learned there. In Mali, you can choose your tax rate. Basically, you go to negotiate your taxes, and they go like, so we want to pay 3%, you want to pay 30%. You can also bring a goat and use that as your tax payment. Um, and from that, we calculate the, the, the salary levels. We have a baseline per country that's based on market rates, and then a city adjustment for expensive cities that's based on living cost. So we do take market rates into account for the US, but we don't take market, uh, market rates into account for uh, San Francisco, but we do take into account that the rent is really high in San Francisco. Here's actually the code. I promise code. There's the, oh, there's, it's a bit cut off. The result is basically the rounded, we have our own rounding method to be more favorable to our employees. So it's uh, taxes applied on top of the before taxes. We apply if someone's working part-time. Uh, before taxes is a monthly value times 12. Monthly is the, the base value um, plus the increase for the level you're at times the level plus the city adjustment exchange to the local currency. Yep, that's essentially it. If we would pay less than zero, we just pay zero. We don't make people pay. No. <laughs> and with that, we've actually calculated the rates for 3,536 cities in 209 countries. For four of these countries, we also have 92 regions. You might wonder, 209 countries, there aren't that many countries, I recommend to you this YouTube channel. <laughs> I also found myself in that income tax gem to for the first time specify what this gem sees as a country and stating that this is not a political opinion but just trying to model income tax best. Uh, currencies are very tricky, uh, employees that are uh, not in the US or uh, Germany can pick their own currency. We have uh, conference allowance converted to the currencies. I imported a set, a list of currencies with exchange values, uh, which I didn't know when importing. This currency list included gold. So if you work at Travis CI and we pay you in gold, you get 4.45 ounces of conference allowance per year. I assume this is how you go home. <laughs> and we've rolled this out. We've used that for all our new hires for, to replace salary negotiations. We're very happy with it. It reflects what we set out to solve. We think the rates that come out are competitive. Based, uh, so there are some relation to market rates. They're comfortable. We think people can live off them. They're fair. This is, has to do with the uh, uh, rules applying to everyone, for instance, they're feasible, they're within the capabilities of our company, and they're prospective, so people know there is a path to take. And most importantly, I think it's a model that everyone participated in and can participate in shaping how that develops in the future. Thanks. If If you have questions, I don't know if there's time now. Otherwise, hit me up later or tweet at me, email me. Uh, I also brought stickers.
um, thank you, Constantine. I have no qualms about my salary, but I absolutely love what you guys are doing at Travis. So, uh, yes. round of uh, round of applause, and maybe you can set one question. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. How, what's your plan for bringing existing employees across to this? Have you done it, or is it going to be a um, gradual thing? So we actually started doing that. Um, so we've brought on. Ex so all of our engineering team, I think, is now on the framework. So we have this concept of people being on the framework and people being off the framework. Um, we started rolling that out. We don't have all the career paths done. So we have the career paths done for uh, software engineers, designers, uh, support. We're working on our administration career paths right now. Um, so that's why not everyone is on this now, but the majority of Travis CI is paid in accordance to the salary framework. Yes, so we've actually discussed this, uh, releasing this public. Uh, first of all, we want to actually uh, talk more about this, blog about this, not just to like show off what we did, but also to get a conversation started that goes further than just Travis. Um, we still need to figure out what work needs to be done so that we can actually release our app, um, which would probably also be quite interesting for people out there. Um, yes, so this is, uh, where do I have the slide, the currencies are tricky. Uh, so what we actually have is we have a Travis CI exchange rate, which means we picked exchange rates at certain points in time and decided that that's the exchange rate we use for the calculation. These exchange rates are usually picked at times that are favorable to the person paid in this uh, currency. Uh, we also um, update this, but this is a semi-manual process, so we need to decide um, do we up the change rate, um, and the reasons there might be extreme changes, or we actually plan to review this on approximately a yearly basis. Um, if someone thinks the exchange rate is not in the future. They can go to the currency page in our salary app, click the discuss link, which will automatically either go to the existing issue about the currency or create a new one, and then uh, mention that it's not in their favor. What we've also did is that while, while I briefly mentioned people might be able to choose their currency, um, so we have employees that are not getting paid on what the local currency is. And the main reason for choosing that is we have an employee in Mexico. The Mexican peso is really unstable, so she chose to um, get paid in euros instead. Um, so that's one approach we also take there. Uh, one last short question. Uh, hello. Okay. Uh, I am Wes Sander. Is it uh, actually a working business model? Because uh, I also play some sense version. For instance, we have a project that mostly similar to the question we looked at before. Because we have a project that uh, the tax rate of different countries is different, something like that, and it changes constantly during the rule of the government. Uh, yeah, I, got, I got the application that it changes the tax form every three months for Europe country, just Europe, you know, that also be a job so. Uh, perhaps I can, uh, you can talk to him after, yeah. during okay. lunch, so sorry. Uh, so, a round of applause. 